Hey guys, this is Rich. Today we are going to build our Sony a7S III underwater rig. In our previous tech video, Sony a7S III underwater, I mentioned the tiny Sony a7S III display and need to build a big 5-inch screen with the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus. I'm going to start by talking about my first experiences with Atomos and this new display and what you have to buy to put it in our rig. Next we'll show you how to configure the A7S III to use the external Ninja 5 Plus as a display and recording device based on the settings we made in the last video. Next I'll hook up the A7S III to the Ninja 5 Plus and show you how I configure the Ninja. Once it is all working I will assemble our new Nauticam rig system, get it running, and go over the Nauticam's amazing wet lens. Sony lenses and port shoes. Some MacGyver tricks we used. Our scaled down version of the rig to shore dive Bonaire's wild east coast. And take a brief look at our lights. I will turn it all on and show you it working. I won't be covering lubricating seals or accessing every possible feature of the housings, ninja, and camera systems. The intent is to show you how to assemble a working rig both to reduce your work to film underwater and the huge learning curve to save you time. I will give you the status of the custom white balance problem I found in the Sony a7S III in our next tech video. I did report it to Sony and there is indeed an issue which I hope I can get an acceptable workaround for. In the last video, I stated that if you purchase the Sony a7S III, get ready to spend some bucks to have an alternative to their small display. I purchased the Ninja 5 Plus because it supported 4K 10-bit 60 frames per second recordings off the Sony and because it is widely used in the industry. The Ninja 5 Plus was three times the cost of the Ninja 5. The cost to add the Ninja to the rig between basic support components, the Ninja, and housing components is over $5,000. So consider this when buying the Sony for underwater video. Like anything new, you're going to run into challenges. And you really get to see the good and bad sides of the suppliers of the video equipment. When I bought the Sony, the Ninja 5 Plus was not out yet. I found Atomos unwilling to work with two major Nauticam resellers to determine whether the display would fit and operate in the Ninja 5 housing. I didn't want to spend money on an unusable housing. This seems to indicate Atomos doesn't provide early access to their new products to housing manufacturers like Nauticam, leaving underwater cinematographers behind the use of the new equipment. In my prior tech industry career, companies were given early access to products for just this purpose. If true, Atomox should correct this. My previous Nauticam reseller could not tell me anything, and even after the 5 Plus came out, they still could not tell me anything after promises to do so, even though I had purchased my entire GH5S underwater video rig from them. My buddy Steve said to give Reef Photo and Video out of Fort Lauderdale a call. I called them and they said they were getting the 5 Plus in a week and they would put the display in the housing, try all the buttons to see if everything worked and let me know. This is what you should expect from a reseller when you are spending that kind of money. It turned out it all worked. I bought all of my Nauticam equipment and Ninja 5 Plus from Reef. I also discovered that these guys were experts at using Ninja display and recording devices. What a win. My initial experience with the new Ninja was also rocky. The equipment arrived and when I turned on the display I heard this noisy fan sound. It felt warm. I was told that the Atomos runs a bit warm, so I took it on a 60 meter dive and the minute I tried to film Bonaire's windjammer wreck for you guys, it overheated. Atomos' solution to the overheating is to darken your display during recording so you can't see what you are filming. Thank you Atomos. Let me share a use case. As an engineer, I understand that recording video generates the most heat, but darkening the screen so that you can't see what you're filming defeats the purpose 
of buying your device at all. It has to be returned anyway, so why remove the possibility of getting any decent recordings? Given the depth, I chose to focus on completing the dive. With the help of a friend in Read Photo and Video, who gave us a new one out of their upcoming order, I was able to get a replacement Ninja in about five weeks. Guys, if you hear that fan noise from your Ninja, send it back. Now we're going to talk about how to configure the Sony to use the Ninja 5 Plus as a larger display and recording device. First, there will be times when you will need to record on the Sony and not the Ninja. For example, you may be in situations where you have a rougher shore entry and the Ninja is too bulky and cumbersome to take the Ninja along. More on that later. Also, the Sony can record at 120 frames per second, but the Ninja can't, so here you will need to record in the Sony. Here is the supporting parts list for the Sony. I will discuss the lenses later. To record 10-bit 4K color at either 60 or 120 frames per second, you need the faster CFS Express Type-A card. The Sony will take two of these. I use 160 gigabyte CFX Express card and the CFX Express Type A card reader, which can transfer data at 10 gigabits per second. A real stumbler is figuring out how the memory card door opens and closes on the Sony. Let me show you how. To install the CFX Express card on the Sony, simply go to the door, push this button down, slide it out, and flip it. And there's your slots. Now what you do is put your card in like this. Click, goes in place, push it in, and you're done. The Sony comes with a battery and charger. I recommend an additional battery to swap out and I have included in the supporting parts list. Let's configure the Sony for external output. You want to go into the manualing system and you want to go to external output over here. Um, you choose HDMI resolution and you want to set it to auto. This basically says that the output going to the Ninja is in the format that I've chosen on the Sony device, which is HLG 3, 60 frames per second, 4K, 10-bit, 422 video. And then we go into the output settings. I'm not recording on this device, so I have the record media during HCM output to off. I have the 4K output set to 60 frames per second, 10-bit. Raw output is set to off, because I don't want to record in raw. I put time quote on the output to on. I think that is... Yeah, put record control on. This means that the record control will drive the recording on the Ninja device. The Atomos Ninja 5 Plus is indeed a very powerful tool to work with, but you will need to purchase a storage device and a cable so that you can record video and transfer files between your Mac or PC, such as LUTs, firmware updates, and recorded video. Here is a list of the supporting parts for the Ninja 5 Plus. It does come with a wall power connection, but you will need the Atomex Power Kit version 2, which comes with two batteries and a charger. You will also need to purchase a special Angelbird SSD card and a StarTech SATA to USB 3.0 cable. My SSD card is one terabyte, and they also sell a two terabyte card. Now we are ready to set up the Ninja. So to configure the Ninja 5 Plus, what I've done is connected the Sony A7S III to the Ninja with the Nauticam HDMI 2 cable. The first thing we want to do is we want to verify the input coming from the Sony. So what I'm going to do is turn the Sony on and you're going to see the display render here and you're going to see the ultra high definition 59.94, 60 frames per second, HLG signal coming in. So we know we have a good connection here. We're showing the waveform. Uh, you can see the setting here on the bottom of the, the Ninja, and the waveform is showing here on the, uh, the lower left-hand side. Let's continue configuring the Ninja. 
One of the challenges when you get the Ninja is finding out where your control panel is for all of your tabs. It's not where you would typically think. On the Ninja, you actually hit the time and you'll have a display come up with all these tabs on it. So that's one of the first things you're gonna learn. The second thing is the arrow keys on either side really don't function. They just basically tell you which direction this tab panel goes. One of the things you would be doing when you first get this device is you're gonna to wanna to register it and you wanna update the firmware and they tell you you need to go to the information display to find out what the current level of firmware is. Well. You obviously don't see it on the screen and none of these are like drop down menus. What you have to do is actually slide over to get to info. That's how you actually find that particular tab. So that gives you an idea of how you start to operate this device. Next thing you wanna do is you wanna go in and we wanna record and set the input to match what is coming out of the, the Sony. Come over to input. What you wanna do is set the trigger to on. This basically says that the Sony is going to be triggering recording on this particular device. The device name is, is Sony. The ILCE-7SM3 actually comes from the camera itself when you connect the two. You want to put log HDR to on and you want to set the camera type to Sony. If you don't do this, your signal will be clipping coming from the Sony. The gamma is HLG, that's what you set it to, and the input gamma is BT2020. This is the latest ultra high definition television standard for, for colors, because that's what's coming out of the Sony. Finally, we want to set HDR auto to off, which is here on the lower right hand side. If we don't do that, when you shut the Ninja off, the next time you will not see these settings for camera, gamma, and gamut appear on the screen. Then what you want to do is set the recording. Now the recording uh, I've set to ProRes HQ. I do that because the other format you can use is ProRes RAW. The file sizes are enormous. Now I mentioned in the last video that I was willing to sacrifice disk space for performance in editing, but ProRes RAW is so enormous you can go through a terabyte drive very quickly. So I've chosen not to do that, even though there are a lot of benefits for recording in RAW. And you can see that the record format is ultra high definition, 59.94 or 60 frames per second. The next thing you want to do is configure what you're going to see on your monitor. And I like to get something close to what you're going to have in your editing process. That involves applying a LUT to what you're seeing on the display. It doesn't actually change what you're recording. You're recording in BT2020 format coming off of the camera, but it does help to get you an idea of close to the type of look that you're trying to capture underwater. To do that, I'm gonna close this tab panel here. I'm gonna hit these additional settings on the lower right-hand side, and we're gonna to go to LUTs. Because we're converting to Rec. 709 at this time, we're delivering on YouTube. We're not delivering on a big movie or something like that. So where you would want to have the higher color format, with, which is BT2020, to go on a higher res, res screen. So you put the, it's a, it's a cube file, which has your LUT. You can, there's a number of places where you can get these online. But you put it on, on your SSD drive, and now you want to apply it to your video. So I'm going to go over in here and hit monitor. You have a number of different options. You have native, Rec. 709, HLG, PQ, and LUT. What I want to do is convert that for, with the, the LUT. So now it's applied and the, and the colors are closer to what you're going to see when you're editing. So it helps you determine whether you're getting your white balance is right or whatnot when you're filming underwater because you're getting close to what the colors are supposed to be. Because coming out of here, the colors in HLG uh, three are, are slightly muted because it's a hybrid log gamma and this this helps in filming. Now the other thing I like to do is deal with the display brightness. That's a big deal. So I'm going to go over here. You have something called backlight. I actually dropped that down to 64% because I want to get closer to what you're recording. The display is much brighter than what you're actually filming. And although you have a waveform, which I've selected, and this is again, you turn this on and off, I leave this waveform on here. And you can see this waveform actually shows where the light area is. The dark area is this little section in the middle here. 
and then it gets lighter over on this side here. And you want to try to keep this under the 100%. You want to basically keep it in the full dynamic range in this, in this uh, what you're filming. Uh, so that helps you in, in adjusting your exposure underwater and your aperture. The next thing you'll want to possibly do is turn on focus peaking. You can see here, this is the, these are actually the settings for how they render the focus peaking. I set a color to yellow because that's the inverted color for blue, for colors. And so this gives you the greatest contrast when you're filming. And I try to give it a thicker pattern, which is the, what's on the far right. Okay, so that actually configures what focus peaking looks like. But if you want to turn it on, you're going to want to go here. And you can see this is actually because it's close to the wall. We've got continuous auto focus on and you're getting this yellow color because it's right in front of you. You can turn this off on the Ninja display. There is a button for, for focus peaking, but that's how you, uh, on, on the Nauticam housing, which basically goes to uh, activating this here. And you can turn it off if you want. That's what I do for configuring the Ninja for filming underwater. If you recall, we set up the Ninja for external record triggering from the Sony. And we really should check to make sure that works. So I'm gonna go reach over to the Sony, I'm gonna hit the record button, and you should see a red border coming around your display to show that you're actually recording on the Ninja. So we'll do that. And there you go, it's recording. Now we can go put the Ninja and the Sony into the housing. I built our underwater camera rig based on Nauticam housing equipment. I like how they are constructed and I particularly like their vacuum system which keeps water out. I also used Nauticam for my Panasonic GH5S setup. I run with two versions of the rig, one with the Ninja 5 Plus and one without. There is the full setup which includes the Ninja 5 Plus display and a scaled down version to shore dive the East Coast. You rarely want to take the full rig to do shore dives on Bonaire's wild East Coast. At first glance, it all seems overwhelming, but we will attempt to break it down. I will discuss the key controls I use on the housing, but for the complete set, I will include a link to the manuals in the description. Assemble time. This is the rig with the Ninja 5 Plus housing above the Sony housing. A closer look shows easy access Sony controls in the Ninja housing mounted via a wide ball mount clamp. This is the left Sony housing unlock. This is the right housing unlock, autofocus on lever and record lever. Here we have white balance button, function button, aperture and shutter speed dials. Here we have the Sony display selection, ISO and control wheel buttons. At the front we have a camera on off switch and lens port unlock. I rarely touch Ninja buttons. The Sony triggers recording and I preset focus peaking. This wide ball mount clamp positions the Ninja housing. The Nauticam HDMI 2 cable attaches to the Sony housing M24 port and the Ninja housing. Let's unlock the Ninja housing and install the Ninja 5 Plus. Here is the Ninja end of the HDMI 2 cable. The housing on-off button would not reach the replacement Ninja on-off button. I used an eraser top and tape to fix it. Plug in the HDMI 2 cable and place the Ninja into the housing in the holding box provided. Close the two locks. Flip the vacuum switch to on. Close and lock the Ninja housing. Pump up the vacuum seal until the vacuum seal indicator turns green. Screw the cap back on the vacuum port. Let's unlock the A7S III housing to install the camera. Here is the Sony end of the HDMI 2 cable. Unlock and remove the camera tray. Attach it to the camera. Open the A7S III HDMI 2 door to access the port and plug it in. Remove the wide-angle lens cap and engage the lens until you hear it click at 28 millimeters. 
we don't, nothing will display on the Ninja and you can't record. Slide the camera tray in and lock, making sure the HDMI 2 door does not hit and the camera strap connectors are pointing down. Turn the camera housing vacuum seal to on. Close and lock the back panel and pump the vacuum until the vacuum seal indicator turns green. Turn on the Ninja. Now turn on the Sony A7S III. The Ninja display is up and shows the video input from the camera with the light waveform. Turn on the Sony Nauta Cam Record button and a Ninja red recording box should appear. Turn off recording. The red box disappears. The Sony display shows the video being sent to the Ninja. I have the Sony waveform display set. At the front is the Nauticam WWL-1B wet lens. I switched to the WWL-1B wet lens from a normal dome port as you get a 130 degree field of view that is sharp, has excellent contrast, and enables you to focus right in front of the dome port. The wet lens is designed to work directly with the A7S III 28-60 lens even when zooming. Unlike a dome port, the inside does not get coated with Saharan dust or cat hair. We have three long hair cats. The downsize is you can't use it for above and below water shots as it is designed to work underwater. The wet lens comes with a hard cover which I remove in the water. I attach the lanyard to hold the cover until I put it back on to exit. I currently disengage the zoom for wide angle in case I accidentally bump it. I don't use the wide angle port manual focus. Push this blue lock toward the housing and twist off the lens to clean the lens in the port glass. The 28 to 60 port is locked in place by the port lock. A wet lens bayonet mount is attached to the port to easily mount and unmount the wet lens. For macro, I replace the wide angle port with a macro port designed for my Sony FE 2.8 slash 90 macro lens with zoom gear. I engage the zoom knob. I use a pair of these 15,000 lumen big blue lights and fiber optic trigger. I typically remove the Ninja to record internally in rough conditions. To do this, you will need to remove the HDMI 2 cable from the Sony housing and plug the Nauticam HDMI 2 M24 port. Then, in the Sony external output settings, I turn on record media during HDMI output and I turn off record control from the Sony. This causes the Sony to record internally. This is a list of the Nauticam parts I use to build the rig. Aside from lights and float arms, a list of all the parts used will be included with the description. We hope you found this video helpful and look forward to your comments. If you find these videos helpful, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching.